Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, should there be any gentlemen joining us this evening. And welcome to a very informative, light-hearted, although it is quite a serious topic, uh, with regards to your ethical responsibilities towards your patients regarding infection control. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you that have joined us from across our borders, the likes of Botswana and Swaziland. And um, yes, good news. So we initially sort of advertised that the first 30 delegates would qualify for a free box of Opalescence Go teeth whitening. And um, I'm pleased to say that you'll all be receiving a box of free Opalescence teeth whitening. Uh, these will be, you know, delivered by your Bright uh, Milner's sales representatives, or alternatively, if you are in far areas, um, and you know, as travel's restricted, especially around Gauteng, uh, we will then courier that to you with your next order. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to upload my PowerPoint presentation, and we'll get right into it. And if I may ask, um, should you have any questions, during my presentation that you actually please post those questions in the question bar to the right of the screen and we will then address those questions at the end of the um, PowerPoint presentation. So, Tarin, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah, Sharon, I can see. Okay, great. Let's get started. So, infection control guidelines. I think the first question you need to ask yourself is, you know, are you taking your infection control protocols in your practice just a little more seriously than what you were prior to COVID? And um, during this presentation, you'll be quite surprised as to what the small add-ons have been since this pandemic hit us worldwide. Um, other than that, these are standard infection, compro uh, infection control protocols that have been implemented and gazetted by, you know, the international, these are international infection control guidelines, um, and they should be followed regardless as to whether there's a pandemic or not. So prior to the pandemic, one of the greater reasons for us taking the, um, you know, infection control protocols that we apply in our practice more seriously are the fact that, you know, if we have to think back to when our grandparents uh, were a bit younger, if I can put it that way, not very many people used to cross borders. Today, traveling is frequent. International traveling is something that happens all the time. So you actually need to treat your patients as mo the most infectious people that you're treating because you don't know where they've come from. And with this increased travel, it's also increased the amount of infections, um, you know, cross-border contamination, that type of thing. So, again, I maintain, and, and I think this is what you need to sort of drill down into your own head, is the infection control that you are doing in your practice. It's not for the benefit of the patient, although they benefit out of it, but it's to protect yourself. Because if you think about it, your patients are in your chair anything from 15 minutes to an hour, but you are in that environment the entire day. So the likelihood of you contracting something because you haven't followed proper infection control protocols is far higher than a patient that's been in there for 15 minutes. This chart at the bottom, it's not very updated. I mean, it goes back to 2006 and unfortunately the curve hasn't changed with regards to Africa, but that is a clear indication on how infections have increased. If you look at the red line, which is the amount of HIV infections, and if you look at the blue line, which is the rate of hip, um, tuberculosis infections. And an interesting fact is that South Africa has the highest risk of tuberculosis infections worldwide. And funnily enough, or strangely enough, I should say, it's definitely not a laughing matter, South Africa has no facility to test for tuberculosis. So there's no facility testing whether your products are TB efficient. So contributing factors when it comes to proper infection control is the education and training of staff, it's your immunization programs, the maintenance of your patient records, 
proper hand hygiene, the selection of antiseptic agents, and with that comes, you know, are you buying on price or are you buying on efficacy, which plays a huge role in your proper infection control protocols, your personal protective equipment, and then the sterilization and disinfecting of your surgery and your instruments. So let's start with the education and the training of the staff. I think this is where, especially the bigger practices, even the smaller practices, you need to take into consideration that your chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So every staff member needs to be educated as to what their role is within the practice to keep that chain as strong as possible. And I'm talking right down to the cleaner who's responsible for cleaning the walls and the floors. If those aren't kept, kept spick and span, it doesn't matter how much surface disinfectant you're spraying on the, you know, the operatory surfaces. Um, everyone needs to play their role. So, as I mentioned, educate the staff and make sure that proper procedures are in place with regards to the role that they play within the practice. You actually should have clearly written policies and procedures where if you give someone a role within the infection control chain, that person needs to sign that they've read, they understand what you know, is expected of them, and that needs to be put in their HR file or their, you know, their, their admin file at the practice. So that if there are any comebacks with regards to, say for argument's sake, whoever is responsible for the cleaning of the instruments happens to have a sharps injury. And there is no record with regards to, you know, what is the status of that patient regarding HIV. Um, Things need to be put into place so everyone knows what to do when. And um, as we said, the education should be appropriate to the assigned duties. Immunization programs, well, I think vaccine isn't a, a word hot on the lips of everyone at this point in time, especially with COVID. But yes, immunization programs are absolutely vital. And unfortunately, most dental healthcare workers have their jab at varsity and no one ever goes to be retested with regards to hepatitis. So it's really, really important um, to, to keep up to date with your vaccines. So with you being healthcare workers, you are at risk for exposure to and possible infection um, with infectious organisms. And immunizations are essential part of prevention and infection control programs for dental healthcare workers. So as I mentioned, your hepatitis is a vital. Um, and if you haven't had it, don't wait for your doctor, if you're working in the practice as an assistant or an oral hygienist, to you know, pay for you to go have it. It's your own life, it's your own health, and it's not that costly. Go down to your pharmacy or your general practitioner and get the vaccine sorted. It's also highly recommended that you go for the flu vaccine once a year. And um, you know, sad to say, but I think our flu vaccines will soon be sort of replaced with a, a, a update or a booster shot of the COVID vaccine moving forward. And you know what, all diseases are vaccine preventable. This little uh, picture at the bottom right of the screen actually shows you that Africa in particular um, are hugely high risk areas with regards to hepatitis B. So again, have you been vac vaccinated against COVID-19? You know, um, I know a lot of the healthcare workers were able to get in on the Sasanki uh, program. Um, others were able to register when the next lot started. And a lot of you, I was in the same category now that we're over 50. Um, you're able to, to register and, you know, get that vaccine done, and I strongly urge you to do so. Um, I watched a webinar the other night that was presented by um, Dr. Peter Noach, or he, he likes to just be known as Peter Noach, um, who is the head of Discovery Health, and the statistics that he presented were alarming with regards to, you know, how far we've come with regards to vaccines, and this, this chart actually shows you here that the progress in South Africa, and this is only one day old, so we've only um, administered 1% of this, you know, 1% of our total population has received both doses with regards to the COVID vaccine. And 7.8% of our population has received the first dose. 
but we're way off considering we're a population of 49 million. And it's proven that the patients that have had their vaccines hardly ever reach the point should they ever be hospitalized um, to, to get to ICU. Because yes, the, the, the COVID vaccine is not going to prevent you from ever getting it, but obviously your symptoms will be far milder. So the prevention and transmission of blood-borne pathogens um, is greatest from healthcare worker to, and, you know, or should I say from the patient to healthcare worker, and then from the healthcare worker to transmit that again, either to another colleague or to another patient. And that's where your personal protective um, gear comes into place. Things like your gloves, your surgical masks, your goggles and your face shields, your overcoats or um, uniform with disposable gowns, and then your shoe covers and your mop caps. And if you're wondering why I've only highlighted the shoe covers and the mop caps in red, that would be because those are the only two items that have been added additionally to your personal protective wear since COVID hit. Um, other than that, you should have always been wearing your gloves, your masks, your goggles or face shields, and your overcoats or disposable gowns. So surgical masks, um, I know it's, it's not practiced in South Africa as it should be, sadly enough, um, but you should be wearing a new mask per patient. And that is for both the doctor as well as the dental assistant. I'm very aware, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've been in practices where I've, I've done surveys on behalf of the practice where the assistant is issued one mask in the morning and basically disposes of that mask at the end of the day. Considering we are going through a pandemic, that is a definitely no, and you need to insist on having a new mask with every patient. You also need to make sure that the mask fits your face properly. You know, the purpose of the mask is that you don't inhale any microorganisms. So your nose and your mouth need to be covered properly. And also to make sure that you're wearing the correct mask with regards to the um, filtration. Your mask should have no less than 95% filtration. And an easy test, um, which is commonly done all over, is if you hold your mask under a running tap, just a slight slight uh, run, you know, a slight stream, if I can put it that way, eventually the water should start dripping through the mask. But if the water is just pouring through the mask, that means that uh, you're able to inhale the microorganisms right through the mask, and that's not sufficient protection. A lot of the dental health care workers during this pandemic are actually double masking, or they are actually wearing a K95 underneath their normal essential two mask which is also okay. And your essential two mask, because it covers your KN95, you would then wear one KN95 for the day and you would cover it with a, a clean um, essential two mask after each patient. So your protective eyewear, it's a given. You basically are protecting your eyes from foreign objects. And if you think about this, you know, a, a dentist um, removing amalgam, or uh, preparing a crown, uh, you know, the cutting away of tooth structure, anything can hit you in the eye and it could lead to horrid infection. So as a dental assistant, as a doctor, you should always, even as an oral hygienist, you should always be wearing protective eyewear. Again, double protection has been taken during these COVID times and doctors are wearing both glasses or goggles as well as a face shield to, to give them even further um, protection. So protective clothing, your uniform overcoat, scrubs and disposable gowns. Um, I've slotted in some pictures at the bottom and um, I will touch on this at the end of the webinar, but these are, are items available from Wright Milner's that if you aren't sure as to where you can obtain your disposable gowns, shoe covers, mop caps, etc., Wright Milner's is the place to go. So you can always just give your representative a call in the morning or even our national call centre. Just uh, touching back on the uniform. So with regards to the international infection control guidelines, it's actually recommended that you remove your uniform. So your surgical scrubs should be removed at the practice and you should then change into your civilian clothing before leaving the, the, the rooms. And the reason for that is 
you've got microorganisms that are settling on your clothing during the procedures that you're assisting with or that you are performing, um, be it eight or 10 hours during the day. And if you think about this logically, the first people that you actually are in contact with are your loved ones. It's your children, it's your husband. Yes, we shouldn't be hugging and kissing, but I can assure you everyone's still giving their kiddies a hug unless there's COVID in the household. Um, and you're just transform transferring um, all those microorganisms that you've accumulated during the day across to your loved ones. So that is the reason why you should be removing your work uniform at the office and changing into civilian clothes. Alternatively, you should be getting into the habit of going straight home and changing immediately before interacting with the family. And that's not always possible and it's not always, or it's definitely not always done because a lot of you are taking public transport. So you are rubbing shoulders with the person sitting next to you. Again, you are just adding to cross-contamination. So if we have to look at the gloves, um, someone once asked me, do you have to put single use items on your PowerPoint presentation? And unfortunately I do. I have come across practices and found used gloves in cold sterilant. No joke. So please guys, your gloves are single use items. And again, it's a new glove for every, for every patient. So to reduce the likelihood that microorganisms present on the hands of dental health care workers that will be transmitted to patients during surgical or other patient care procedures. That is the reason why you are putting on gloves. They should be disposed of and they get disposed of in your hazardous waste. And then gloves should be changed between patients or when torn or punctured. Another thing is you cannot leave your surgery to go and fetch a patient file for the dentist in reception and wearing your gloves and then coming back and continuing with the procedure. Those gloves are then contaminated. So those gloves, uh, if there's been no blood involved, which I sincerely hope there isn't, with you now going to fetch a file at reception, um, you are able to actually rub your hands with a waterless gel and continue. Alternatively, you need to remove the gloves and don't a new pair. Just by, way, by the way, a little bit of uh, advertising slotted in here. So for those of you that don't know, and please pass this message on to your dentists as well, we are running a huge promotion at the moment where if a practice invests in 10 boxes of blue nitrile gloves, you actually go into a lucky draw where the dentist can win a brand new Belmont patient chair valued at 160,000 Rand. And we also have a second prize on a key stream intraoral sensor, which is valued at 60,000. So if you think about it, you know, um, gloves, everyone needs them. And if you consider there are 50 pairs in a box and you probably, between you and your dentist, go through a box each a week, 10 boxes won't last that long. Um, and it's a great sort of uh, lotto card, if you want to put it that way, to go into a drawer to win a fabulous new chair or even a digital sensor. So hand hygiene, what's extremely important is to make sure that you are using the correct hand soaps. And why I say that is international infection control protocols stipulate that if you've been involved with a procedure that involves blood, you have no option but to wash your hands under running water using a medicated soap containing chlorhexidine. If you have been involved in a procedure that involves no blood, you are able to get away with just washing your hands with a waterless alcohol gel that contains a minimum of 70% ethanol alcohol. And you know, the feedback I've had over the years, and believe me, I've been in dentistry many years, I think it's going on 22 years now, um, it's not the hand soaps, it's not the products that's drying out your skin. It's the continuous sticking your hands under running water that's causing your skin to dry out. So, you know, just thinking about saving a bit of water as well, consider investing in some of the waterless hand gel as well as a substitute. Again, just some products that are available from Wright Milner's. And I must add that all our hand sanitizers are locally manufactured. 
And the reason for that is to import these products where the formulation is exactly the same, um, you're going to be paying three times the price. So just because it's manufactured locally doesn't mean it doesn't work. And I can assure you that our one manufacturer actually manufactures on the formulary provided to them for net care. So they actually make all net care's infection control products. So what to clean when? After each patient, the first thing that you need to do is remove all soiled instruments and hand pieces from the surgery. You need to clean and disinfect all surfaces touched during the procedure. You need to wipe down the patient chair. You need to clean the suction daily. And I need to add there that if you you know, had a procedure that involved blood, you should actually clean the suction after that patient as well. And then when a surface can't be cleaned adequately, it should be protected with barriers. And uh, something a lot of practices are not aware of, we've got these phenomenal uh, barriers called armor, armor disposable barrier sleeves. And it's basically covers for everything that cannot be cleaned adequately. You take, for example, your keypad. So majority of your, your doctors have gone digital. So there would be a computer, if not two computers, in the actual operatory. Now, you wouldn't be able to wipe down the surface of your keyboard with your surface disinfectant that has high level alcohol. And the reason for that is after a week, you won't have any letters left on your keyboard. So it's suggested that you do carry, you know, cover it with a barrier. A cheaper cost effective way, or should I say a cheat way, is your normal glad wrap that you buy at pick and pay or the spa. If you just wrap your keyboard in the glad wrap, you're still able to see um, the actual numbers and letters on the keyboard and you're able to disinfect the keyboard between each patient as well. So, you know, we don't, I think you get into this rut of uh, what you do on a daily basis, that we don't actually step back and take note of what you do touch during a procedure. And that includes light handles, switches, your x-ray equipment, your dental chair side computers, your reusable containers, your drawer handles, countertops, pens, telephones, and doorknobs. And these all need to be disinfected during each patient. And that's why it's imperative that your doctor does allow you the time to do proper infection control between each patient. So your instrument processing, I know a lot of practices have got the luxury of having someone appointed that does the instrument processing. In other practices, it's the poor assistant that does the running between cleaning the operatory and getting the instruments processed at the same time. But regardless, you need to first of all make sure that your instrument processing area is definitely separate to that of your surgery and ideally should not be in your um, staff kitchen either. It should be a standalone room. Again, we, you know, the, the new practices that have been built as practices they have accommodated having a proper sterilization area and having a proper staff kitchen. But a lot of the older practice where it's been a house that's converted into a dental practice, you don't have the luxury of having separate infection control area to that of the kitchen, but try to keep it as separate as possible. So at the end of the day, if you stand in the doorway of the area where you process your instruments, you should be able to see at a glance what is decontamin you know what is still dirty so your decontamination area your cleaning area where you would be rinsing your instruments under a running tap your preparation and packaging area and your ready to use area if you can get that flow going you know your room is set up correctly and in a lot of cases it's a matter of switching to two sections around, or maybe asking the doctor to bring an electrician in to install extra plugs, but it is doable. Something else you need to take into consideration is you should always have two sinks in your instrument processing area, or alternatively, if you only have one sink available in the practice, you need to have a separate basin. And the reason for that is your contaminated instruments need to be rinsed under running water, Thereafter, 
they get placed either in the basin for you to, to scrub and clean, or alternatively, they get placed in an ultrasonic bath, which we'll cover later. But it's imperative that you do have an empty sink for the rinsing under running water. So for those of you that do not have the luxury of an ultrasonic bath, manual cleaning is quite a hazardous procedure because you risk having a sharps injury. And for that, regardless who does it, whether it's someone that's appointed specifically for instrument processing or whether it's yourself that does it, you need to wear the, the correct protective um, clothing. So you should always have your goggles, you should have gloves and not your latex or your nitrile gloves, you should have heavy duty rubber gloves that are resistant to, to sharp um, instruments. And you should wear uh, either an overall or a um, disposable gown that can be removed before you walk out of that area. Also, your technique is called a, it's called a submarine technique. So it's also quite logical. If you were to scrub your nails with a scrubbing brush above water, there's a lot of splatter. But if you hold your hands underwater, there's no splatter. And that's exactly how you need to scrub your instruments. Underwater, submarine technique. So preparation and packaging, we've covered quite a, a lot of that, but in a nutshell, um, once your instruments have been prepared, so once they've been washed and cleaned, you then need to dry them prior to packing them in your pouches. And the reason for that is your pouches are paper. So you're putting wet instruments in a paper pouch, you're gonna compromise the pouch. Also, all um, autoclaves use distilled water, but you're now washing in municipal water. So you don't want to get the municipal water in your autoclave either. So you will then wash your instruments, check them that they're clean, you will dry them. Again, you do not dry them with a dish towel that gets used over and over and over again. You need to be using your um, disposable towel, your roller towel. And I mean, those come in big jumbo packs that are quite economical to purchase as well. Um, you then pack them in the pouches and they're ready to be popped into your autoclave. Um, and Another reason for packaging them in pouches is that once your sterilization process has been completed, you're then able to store your processed instruments without compromising the instruments. Sterilization, so heat tolerant dental instruments, they must be sterilized in an autoclave. And heat sensitive criti critical and semi-critical instruments, um, they would go in cold sterilant. But I must be honest with you, I think there are very few items nowadays that can't be put in an autoclave. Um, and, you know, just something else to touch on with regards to cold sterilant, which reminds me, burrs. Burrs are a pain in my neck, to be honest with you, because um, it, I don't know, I don't know if it's habit, I can't say it's been taught at university because it's definitely not infection control standards, but you cannot sterilize something that hasn't been processed. So why burrs are being removed from a handpiece and placed directly into cold ster sterilant, no one knows. It's not being cleaned. And you will see that after a while, your burrs actually start changing color. It almost looks like they're starting to rust. Well, I've got news for you. It's not rust, it's dirt. It's the dirt that's clogging up and that's starting to discolor because of the constant um, cold sterilant that's been used. So again, it's vital to wash those burrs prior to putting them in cold sterilant. And another thing, all cold sterilant cannot be diluted with water, um, especially those that contain glutaraldehyde. As soon as you mix glutaraldehyde and water, you will get rust. And uh, burrs that are kept in um, cold sterilant for lengthy periods of time will also be rusted. So yeah, that's definitely something that you can look at in your practices. On that note, there is actually a solution there. And again, please speak to your um, representatives at Wright Milner's or your telesales. We've got a phenomenal product called SteriRight. Um, and there is actually a product that you can use as a cold sterilant. And believe it or not, once your instruments do show start, you know, do start starts showing um, discoloration, it means it's dirt. You just need to give them a good scrub, put them back, and they a for away, ready to be used. So the benefits of an ultrasonic bath, 
The main reason why an ultrasonic bath was developed was basically to increase productivity, improve clean, cleaning effectiveness, and to decrease the exposure of um, the healthcare worker to blood and bodily fluids. So that is the reason why an ultrasonic bath was introduced to a dental practice. Um, yes, it is quite a pricey item, but you know what? It's, it's a long-term purchase. I mean, you don't have to replace it on a monthly basis. They last a long time if they're looked after, and they generally do work. And they are very handy when it comes to the cleaning of your burrs, because again, it's not easy holding those little burrs in your hand and trying to scrub them. So handpiece cleaning, and I must add here, um, we actually do have quite a few videos that can be forwarded to all of you um, with regards to the proper oiling of hand pieces. Um, as you or most of you would know, we are the NSK distributors in Sub-Sahara sub Africa. Um, and we also are able to do demonstrations at practices for you. If you're not 100% sure on how to clean and, and sterilize your, your hand pieces. So an important factor is, you know, a dental hand piece is the most important instrument in the practice. It's complex, it's expensive, and it's not disposable. So you really need to look after those hand pieces. And unfortunately, a hand piece is also a potential high risk cross-contamination medium. Again, standard infection control guidelines on an international level is you should have new hand pieces for every patient. And yes, I do know that not every practice is able to do that. But in saying that, you still need to wipe down your hand pieces between patients. You still need to oil your hand pieces between patients. And if there was any blood involved with the procedure, there is no negotiations that handpiece has to be autoclaved. I want you to think about, you know, your car engine. Your car engine runs on like, I think it's 4,000 revs per minute. Excuse me, I'm no um, technician. But uh, yeah, it runs on about 4,000 revs per minute. And your handpiece can run up to 100,000 revs per minute. Losing my ears here. Um, so we put oil in our car to keep the engine cool, but yet you don't want to oil your hand pieces, which are running like at a hundred times faster than what your car engine is. And that is one reason why we do oil the hand pieces. It's to actually cool down the inside of the hand piece and that then enables the hand pieces to last longer. But at the same time, if you look at hand piece um, oil, the likes of panda spray, for example, that also contains alcohol. So that will disinfect your hand pieces at the same time. And then you can also just take your surface disinfectant, which if you are purchasing a surface disinfectant according to efficacy and not to price, uh, it should have a TB kill as well. And you're able to wipe down your hand piece. It's just imperative that you purge those hand pieces before the next patient. And the reason for that is you don't want your patient's mouth filled with oil um, and then your dentist's restoration is going to fail. So, something to consider. So, cleaning and sterilization, we've basically covered that. Dental hand pieces must be cleaned, they must be lubricated. As I say, ideally, they should be autoclaved. Um, and talking of autoclaves, so the ideal autoclave for hand pieces would obviously be your type B autoclave because that contains your vacuum cycles that is able to push the air, you know, through your hollow instruments. That's why they were designed. But you also get some fabulous um, hand, uh, hand piece autoclaves uh, specifically for autoclave, I mean, for hand pieces. And then you've also got other little add-ons, um, like, for example, your, your NSK has got a, a set where it actually oils your hand pieces for you. So there are lots of things that can be added to your practice to ensure the job's done properly. So dental unit water lines, biofilms, and water quality. Um, so the center of disease control they recommend that you should be working off a self-contained water system. So that will be the screw-on bottle of water onto the chair that you aren't working off the municipal water. And the reason for that is not all municipal water is safe. 
we are sort of lucky to a certain degree here in South Africa that our water is relatively safe. But at the same time, I think our water quality is starting to, to, to um, deteriorate at a fast, fast rate. Um, and you need to clean the, the, the biofilm um, on a daily basis. So if you think about this logically, you've got your water bottle attached to your chair. And from that water bottle, you've got very thin plastic pipes that are carrying that water to your handpiece. So it's quite a low flow rate. And at times, your chair will actually also not be used. If you consider like now, where you probably have a lot of patients that are canceling because they've either got COVID or come into contact with COVID um, over weekends when you're not working or during the holiday season when the practice is closed. So you would all have experienced that should you have come back from either a long weekend or a holiday and you purge those syringes that you get a bit of a smell coming out of the the, the water um, and that's because bacteria has already started to grow in your tubes so when we say the treating of the water lines it's not the treating of the water the argument i get from doctors is yes but i use distilled water well, newsflash, distilled water is the biggest breeding ground for bacteria. Um, so you need to actually put something in that bottle in your self-contained water system that will then treat the lines inside your chair that all bacteria and all fungi is done away with. And there's no chance of that actually reaching the handpiece and probably exiting the, the handpiece into your patient's mouth. And then if possible, test your water quality if you're totally unsure as to how safe the water actually is. Seems to be ahead of my slides here. So housekeeping also, you know, um, you need to have your cleaning ladies understand how imperative it is for them to do their job properly and also how important their role is within the infection control chain at your practice. So floors need to be cleaned on a regular basis and spills should be cleaned up promptly. Um, and then mops, I mean, a silly thing like a floor mop. You should have more than one floor mop in a practice. And the reason for that is, say for example, the child has spilled their juice in your reception area and you've now mopped up the juice, um, or let's reverse that. Say there's been a blood splatter in the surgery and you've cleaned up the blood splatter and now the child's messed their juice in reception. You can't take that same mop and go clean the juice in reception because you are causing cross-contamination. You basically cleaned the blood and now you're cleaning the floor in the reception area with the same mop. A mop that's been used needs to be washed and thoroughly dried before used again. So, you know, make sure that your... your um, staff have sufficient mops to use. Other special consideration needs to be taken with regards to saliva ejectors, um, your x-ray equipment, and let's go through each one one at a time. Your saliva ejectors. So an interesting fact here, if your patient happens to close their lips around the saliva ejector, that can actually cause a backflow. And whatever you've sucked out the patient's mouth, sorry, I hope none of you are having dinner at this point in time, actually will be put back into the patient's mouth. So special consideration needs to be taken there. Your x-ray equipment, you have to wipe your x-ray equipment down. You know, you've got your patients having a pan taken where they're standing and resting their foreheads against the, um, the plastic holder to put your patient in, in, in the right position. Those need to be wiped down. Your pre-procedural mouth rinses are important and we'll cover that, as is the handling of biopsy specimens and extracted teeth. So your pre-procedural mouth rinses, there was an article done in the States a few years ago where they actually proved that if you got your patient to rinse with normal tap water, you would reduce the amount of microorganisms released into the atmosphere by at least 50%. So if you were to use a antimicrobial mouth rinse, um, you would reduce it by about 90%. And I'm sure that you've got these inconsiderate patients that come and see you after lunch who have failed to brush their teeth um, and that rinsing will actually make your life a bit easier as well. This picture I've inserted here is a, a whole um, webinar on its own 
um, IRINs. And you're actually able to watch that webinar from the Wright Milner's website. But IRINs is a molecular iodine pre Well, it's a, it's a mouth rinse. Uh, we've got stacks of practices that are using this as a pre-procedural mouth rinse because it is effective against COVID-19. But we also have practices that are using your normal anti antimicrobial mouth rinses, like your little tablets that you dissolve or something like um, Refresh from Germany, uh, Germafine, but are using the iron for themselves and for their dental assistance. And it's a phenomenal product. So do yourself a favor. And if you get a chance, go and watch that webinar. Handling of extracted teeth, again, you know, you've, you've extracted a tooth and be it that you want to give it to the child to take home for the tooth fairy or the tooth mouse, or whether you need to send the tooth off to a dental laboratory for color matching, uh, that tooth, because it's contaminated with blood, it needs to be rinsed under running water, and then it needs to be disinfected with your surface disinfectant. Also, any extracted teeth containing dental amalgam and they need to be placed in a special container that's marked amalgam. Do not put that in with your other medical waste because that waste is generally just incarcerated and the mercury would end up back in our environment. So in summary, guys, I'm not going to keep you long tonight. I mean, you know what? I'm sure majority of you have been cooking dinner while listening to this webinar or are attending to happy hour, as I call it, with bathing of kids. Um, but yes, in summary, protect yourself. Your patients will benefit from what you're doing to protect yourself. Update your patient records. Try to get your receptionist in the habit of a patient that hasn't been there in a long time. You know, engage with the patient. Find out, have they traveled recently? Have they been to any exotic places? And make a note of that in the patient file. Read the label of the products purchased for infection control. You know, again, with doing surveys in practices, I've come across practices that invest in too many products. You possibly have one product that can be used for more than one application. Again, don't think you are saving your doctor money by diluting a product when you're not supposed to be diluting the product because then you might as well be using water and it's totally ineffective. Also, read, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> read the contact time. If your surface disinfectant says your contact time is 10 minutes, well, I'm sorry for you. You need to stand and watch that surface dry for 10 minutes. I highly recommend that you then sort out another surface disinfectant product that only has a one minute contact time or two minute contact time. And don't take short, shortcuts. You know, it's human nature. Friday afternoon, you want to get out of there, but you are a link in that chain. And should you take shortcuts, you will be the weak link in the chain. So please don't take shortcuts. And then again, make sure all staff members are up to date with what the infection control protocols are in your practice. So guys, thank you very much for your attention. I just want to remove this. Um, Just see here. Tarin, am I back on screen or is it still my PowerPoint presentation? Hi, Karen. You're on screen now. Okay, cool. Uh, do we have any questions? No questions. Good. Well, that was a short and sweet yeah. webinar. Um, as you know, it has been CPD accredited, so you will get your CPD certificate sent through to you, and um, there will also be a, a rerun available should you have missed any points, or if you would like to go through the presentation again with your dentist. Alternatively, please feel free, as I said, to contact your, your Wright Milner's representative or contact our national call center. I am going to ask um, Tareen, who sends out your certificates, to attach the flip file of our latest infection control protocol guidelines. They will include um, lovely articles that you can read up on. There's some um, videos that you can watch and also all the products available for the specific areas of infection control in your practice. 
So on that, guys, I'm Sharon Hyten. I'm based at the Johannesburg offices as sales manager. Hope you have a phenomenal evening and thanks for joining us. Good night. Bravo, bravo.